So, Matthew 8. Um, I'm not, because uh, I took up a chunk of time, 10, 15 minutes on that. I'm not going to talk for a huge long time today, but we are going to look into these astonishing verses in uh, Matthew 8, where um, Jesus, as usual, um, really, you know, he's a, he's a man who goes to the heart of a matter. And um, just like had this uncanny ability to nail people, to just find out exactly what was going on in their hearts and pin them down. And it's exactly what we see when we look into this passage here. Um, I'm going to tell you a little story uh, before we get going. Um, I've often said that Karen, um, Karen lives it and I talk about it. That has happened all the way through my my married life, and um, it's been like uh, an excruciating lesson in um, making my words at the front match up with what actually happens in our lives. And um, the the thing that happened for me and Karen was that I was being called into ministry, and um, I, I really passionately wanted to serve Jesus and do evangelism. Um, but we were living in this, some of you have heard me say this before, we were living, I'm just looking up something like this, we were living in this uh, yuppie pad, we had our nice uh, two-bedroom home, uh, but it was all kitted out beautifully and everything about it was wonderful, and I'd just been leaving this uh, career in banking, but I had um, a kind of sense in my own heart that God wanted me to reach the poor, um, uh, but I wanted to do it for my yuppie pad. I um, I wanted to serve Jesus and leave my career in banking, but I, I didn't want to leave everything. Uh, it was conditional fellowship. Um, so I was hatching all these plans for uh, uh, not moving, but but planting a church. And then one day I came home and found Karen crying uh, in our bedroom, uh, all sort of weepy. Um, I'm not a man of, of great tears. Every now and again, I, I get emotional about things. Uh, so I was, this is early on in my married life, and I was getting used to being someone who exhibited a bit more emotion. I just showed a cover of the video at the time of The Sound of Music, and tears would emit what is this strange moisture on casual. Even sometimes at adverts, Karen can be emotional. Um, it's true. Um, I've never seen a quite a Monty Python sketch yet, but I think the potential's there. So I was getting used to this kind of thing. And uh, I said, what's going on? And she said, well, I've just been reading that bit in Matthew chapter 8. I said, what is that bit in Matthew chapter 8? She said, it's when Jesus said, foxes have holes and birds have nests, and the Son of Man had nowhere to lay his head. And I said, yes, that's a good Bible passage, isn't it? She said, I think God's speaking to us. I said, really? What's God saying to us? She said, I think we need to move to the council estate where you want to do your work. And I said, no, I don't think that's what Jesus meant. <laughs> I think... I think what Jesus meant was, in your heart, in your heart, you've got to be prepared to move. Like, he didn't mean it. Like, there's loads of weird stuff in the Bible, like killing your neighbor's ox and all this sort of stuff, and it can't mean it. Can said, no, I, I think that's the Lord. And long story short, uh, that verse really spoke to us, and it followed, uh, what followed was essentially has been and still continues to be a lifetime of challenge. That there, our lives have been punctuated by moments where God has spoken to us. And there are a number of key landmark verses where we have been called to lay it all down. And much of that is in secret. Uh, some of that is visible. Uh, I actually think um, that one of the reasons uh, that despite our flaws in our lives, that my daughters have come through for the Lord is that they have seen us pursue some of these things at sometimes personally great cost so that the gospel has been real despite our you know they've seen us row you know they've seen me get things wrong most days and you know but they have seen a heart to follow and aside from all the weirdness and sin and failure and, and Karen, when I was talking about this over a cup of tea earlier with Karen, uh, Karen said, well, actually, I think it's a fear of God as well. Um, and, you know, I can speak for Karen. 
Karen does fear the Lord. And I think, I think, you know, the girls have seen that. And I think underneath this, there's some stuff here which, as we start to unpack it, is extremely challenging. Um, so we need to get what's going on. So let me read it to you. Uh, let's take it from verse 18 from chapter 8. Now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to depart to the other side of the sea. Then a scribe came and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. That is a statement and a half right there. I remember sitting on the edge of my bed at 18 and a quarter, having just met Jesus Christ and saying to God, I will follow you wherever you tell me to go and do whatever you ask me to do, no matter what. I'd just given my life to Jesus. I had no idea that God would, A, take that promise and declaration very seriously and B, just what that would mean. And I'm still working it out. I'm, I pray that there are many chapters in my life yet to go. I still don't think I've come to the fullness of the understanding of what it means that I prayed that prayer at that time. There's more to come. I'm absolutely convinced of it. I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no way, nowhere to lay his head. And another disciple said to him, Lord, permit me to first go and bury my father. And this is the bit that people think this is so harsh. But Jesus said to him, follow me and allow the dead to bury their own dead. That's not the words of a loving pastor, is it? And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And then we go into the narrative about the storm. So why did Jesus respond in this particular way? And what does he actually mean? Did he actually mean what he was saying? Well, I think, yes. I think what happened here is the scribe is caught up in the moment. He's seen what Jesus is doing. He's seeing what he's about. And he's like, I really want to get me some of this. This guy is amazing. Which is how, hopefully, 100% of us here, when we first met Jesus, felt the same. Like, this guy, Jesus, he is absolutely phenomenal. And then the scribe says, so I'll follow you wherever you go. But Jesus has, as I just said a minute ago, this uncanny way of looking into people's hearts and knowing exactly what was going on. Some commentators say that actually what was happening here was, was that the scribe could see that there was going to be this victory, this warrior leader that was going to rise up and change the nation. And everyone's like, I want to get me some of that. I want to get in on this action. But Jesus looks straight to the heart and he knows that this is a rash comment because this is what it meant to be one of the first followers of Jesus. Andrew was crucified. Bartholomew was flayed alive, crucified and beheaded. James was beheaded and stabbed with a sword first. James, the other James, was martyred by being thrown from a temple. Uh, John died of old age. Jude was beaten to death with a club. Judas committed suicide. Matthew was burned and stoned. Peter was crucified upside down. Philip was martyred. Simon was crucified, or they think was sawn in half. And Thomas was stabbed to death with a spear. I'll follow you. I'll follow you wherever you tell me to go. I do whatever you ask me to do. And Jesus is like, really? Are you sure you want that? Are you sure this is what you want to engage with? Because to follow me means actually mass is a sacrifice. When he says the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head, he obviously had a, a, a ministry that moved him around. He was itinerant in his time. But it didn't mean he didn't sleep or he didn't ever have a bed and he didn't eat because we know he enjoyed hospitality. What he's saying is you cannot follow me and not live a life of sacrifice. You cannot follow me and follow the world as well. And we need to try and understand what that means in our time. 1 John 2.15, if you're taking notes or making references, says, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 
I find that incredibly challenging because <laughs> I do love loads of stuff in the world. I mean, I'd love a super yacht. I would. I'd, I'd love a brand new Fireblade every week. I would. I'd love a holiday in the Caribbean. The Bible is clear. Anyone who loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Hebrews 11, Abraham saw himself as a pilgrim passing through the land of promise. It, nowhere stable on the earth, dwelt in tents. Romans 12, key verses. Key verses for me, actually, personally. You are a living sacrifice. It's challenging stuff, isn't it? I, I mean, you can't ignore it. It's what Jesus said. So somehow we've got to try and make sense of it. And what I do know is that history is absolutely littered with people who went all out for Jesus and they changed the world. All out for Jesus and everything changed around them. And I, every now and again, someone sends me something or you know, says, oh, I think this would be good for you. And about uh, two months ago, someone sent me through the post a book a really old book, I mean, it's falling apart, uh, about John Wesley, you know, the founder of the Methodist Church. And um, they wrote in the front, they said, you know, just keep looking up and keep pursuing Jesus. I saw this book and thought, this is for you, and thanks for all you're doing, blah, blah, blah. So um, I meant to bring it with me today to show you this beautiful old book. I actually like old books, and, um, but I left it on my desk. So... <laughs> I uh, emailed work and said, can you take, I knew where the pages were I wanted to read you, so they've taken a photo and I, I printed them out. So I'm going to read you this account of Wesley, um, which will take a couple of minutes, but I, th I, I think it will stir you to so just think about our lives. And then I've got some bullet points, and, and then we are going to uh, worship, and then we're going to eat cake, which apparently is award-winning. Is that right? Where is Iona? Is she gone? Apparently she won first prize in a cake making competition. So you can, don't love the world, but love the cake. So we're going to go on for that in a minute. When they came to John Wesley, that great vision of the world as his parish, he very soon saw that to undertake and overtake the great task of carrying the good news of the gospel right through the land, he would have to enlist some irregular forces as well as the regular ones. So he began to appoint carefully selected men as lay preachers. John Senek, the first of this splendid band, led a life as devoted as John Wesley himself. He burns out at the age of 37. We'll ignore that bit. This is not good. And lies in the Moravian burial ground at Chelsea. Thomas Maxwell, his name is second on the list, actually started to preach before John Wesley. Gave him permission. Wesley, hearing this, journeyed in hot haste from Bristol to London to stop him preaching. But found, as his far-seeing mother told him, that this young man clearly had a call from God to preach every bit as much as John Wesley himself. One by one, others were added to this core of rough riders. That's what they called them. They called them the rough riders. It's like the A-team of its time, the band of brothers. And they proved exceedingly useful in many ways. They prepared the way for their great and tireless leader. They worked under him and with him, and they carried on when he was moved to another center. They were poorly paid, poorly clad, poorly equipped, poorly housed, but they had the courage of heroes. We enjoyed great poverty and great peace, said one of them very simply. They covered vast distances, mostly on horseback and sometimes on foot. We can the more readily understand this when we hear that in 1746, John Wesley divided the whole of England into seven circuits. Peter Jacko, for instance, was appointed to the Manchester circuit, which took in Cheshire, Lancashire, Derbyshire, Staffordshire and part of Yorkshire. That's quite a big circuit. Think of what that involved in every way of tireless travel over the roughest of 18th century roads. Many a day rode his horse 30 to 40 miles, preaching three or four times in different places on the way every day. And at the end was thankful to have a little clean straw as his bed. These rough riders of John Wesley faced bitterest persecution. Mayors and magistrates scolded them and sometimes imprisoned them as pestilent fellows. Often rowdy mobs incited by people who ought to have known better interfered with their open air services and pelted them with stones, rotten apples, turnips and filth of every kind, the cudgels of Satan, as one man quaintly put it. My head was broken with a blow, wrote Thomas Lee, but I never found my soul more happy. It was this same indomitable soul who at the end of his day had said triumphantly that if all the hardships of his life as one of John Wesley's travelling preachers were spread out before him, he would pray, Lord, if thou wilt give me strength, 
I will now begin again. No wonder these rough riders were invincible. Like John Wesley himself, they were denouncing no uncertain terms the evils of the day, smuggling, drunkenness and worldliness. They stood alone in marketplaces and on village greens, and they gave their message in just the same way as their great leader did, and with the same results. Their wives were just as heroic, desperately poor, despised by their neighbours, continually on the move, left alone to manage their large families. These pioneer preachers' wives deserve a place of honour, or their own in the thoughts of Methodism these two centuries after. John Wesley enlisted into his regiment of rough riders, bakers, stonemasons, miners, labourers, troopers in the king's army, as well as a few had more education or higher position in life. We do well to honour the fathers at Begatus and to stand at the salute of John Wesley and his regiment of tireless horsemen as they go riding by. Surely some who hear their story will want to catch their spirit. I, d I read that and I thought, that's amazing. How is it they got so gripped by the Lord they would lay everything down to serve him? Everything. Maybe even their lives. And then I look at my own life and I think, I am so comfortable. And I remember when I first felt called to be a full-time evangelist, I would have... I would have paid to have done the job. I would have given everything to do it. And somehow that gets numbed and blunted over time. Numbed and blunted over time. So I felt myself reading this passage, just real memories stirring up of the early days when I was called back and thinking, how do we make sense of this today? Called to a place, got our lives to lead, we don't want to be all weird about it and say you can't have nice things. You don't want to go back to the days of puritanical weirdness, smashing up instruments and all graven images and doing stupid things and killing all joy. I don't think that's what this is about. But, and I think it's more than saying you've got to be willing. I think we've actually got to do stuff. You know, it's fun thing to say you've got to have the heart for it, but I think we've got to do it. So what does it mean to, to not love the world but love Jesus more? So I wrote a list. It's not an exhaustive list. It's just an example. Um, and if any of this seems near the knuckle, it's not pointing at anyone. Literally, I just sat down and I wrote a list. I just, I literally just tapped out a list of things that sprung to mind, which speak to me as well. I'm as much looking at myself when I write, when I read this list out as, as anyone else. This is what I think I'm feeling challenged on. I don't wait until my mortgage is paid off before I make a radical decision to serve Jesus, if that's what God's saying. Matthew 6.25, don't, don't worry. Seek first the kingdom or waiting until a bonus has come in. I remember talking to one guy who was a, a stockbroker in London. Already had a bunch of money in the bank and he felt a call to be an evangelist and he, and he wanted to go to Bible college. And he went through the selection process and he was going to defer it. I said, why are you deferring it? He said, because I'm going to get another 300 grand in October if I stay there. And I said, how much money you got in the bank? It's about a million quid. I said, oh. I said, what do you think Jesus is saying about that? He said, I think he wants me to have the 300,000. I went, well, just bring it before the Lord. And uh, it's okay. So he did. And then he, he sent me a message and he said, I brought it before the Lord. And, I, and I, I felt Jesus say, well, what's more important? There's another 300 grand in the bank or, you know, an extra year of telling people about me. He said, so I'll turn me back on a bonus. So I said, brilliant, that's great. So I said, we'll, you know, turn back. Anyway, the bank paid it out anyway. <laughs> so I thought, that's good for him. And he was incredibly generous, so he wouldn't just sit on his money. So I just thought, well, don't just wait. Because we do do that, you know. Don't wait, because there's things, there's always options in front of us to do stuff for the Lord. There's ways to navigate things. We trust God with our kids, those who love Jesus more. We trust God with our kids. And twice, I know this is a difficult one, but twice, Karen and I have had to move because of God's call. Right in the middle of school's year, school years. We had to move our kids in the middle of infant school. We had to move them in the middle of junior school. And we've always said to the Lord, if you call us, we'll be, and we have to do this. We've moved them again. And they're, and they're doing all right, actually. I'm embarrassing, but they're, they're doing all right, you know. 
And I, I think because God, God had our backs in it. We were certain the Lord was speaking. I mean, sometimes we'll say, you know, we trust God with our kids, but then we're static while the whole school system rolls past. But what if God called you? What if he did to make some kind of sacrifice? I know that this can make people really grumpy and like really irritated with the preacher when they say stuff like this. I'm not saying anything that I haven't tried to live out myself and stuff that I always feel challenged on. But we also have a responsibility, I think, to teach our kids that God will come through. And sometimes we have to go and put ourselves on the edge and trust that God will come through. And, and when they see those lessons being played out, you know, I mean, there was a time when, when we had to have conversations with Emily and Annie. It's like, oh, we're moving again. You know, we had to talk it through. It's like, why are we doing it? And, you know, and it was, there were times when it was tough. But we can see now, looking back, the hand of God on them. And I think there are various things in our characteristic as a family that have come through because we're prepared to trust the Lord on it. And you can get trust fatigue, trust me on that. Like, oh, days are real. Have I really got to do this again? Have I got to go again? But some people are called to it. And I don't think it's for everyone. But I think all of us are called to have a pilgrim heart. And all of us are called to face heaven and to trust Jesus. And it might be that you have to face that uncomfortable moment one day where God's called to go and reach the poor or do something radical. He's going to settle upon you. And then we have a choice to make. Um, I think people who love Jesus more than the world don't use busyness as an excuse to not do kingdom stuff because we always find time to do the things that we actually want to do. And I know it sounds really harsh, but it's true. You know, when it came to, like, planting the church, I was like, looking at my diary thinking, oh, I've got so much on. I've got, how am I going to do this? I've got so much on. But you had to make a decision what stuff you're going to lay down so that you could do kingdom stuff. There's even stuff, I mean, there's loads of things I actually want to do. And I really annoy Karen sometimes. I'm like, I really want to learn, because I'm a fidget. Like, I like music and art, and, and, and I've got I, there's loads of hobbies on my to-do list I want to do. And that I'd like to be a police special or take up archery or want to be a taekwondo master or something. And Karen's like, you've got too much on. And I've had to decide what things I'm going to do and what things I don't do so that I can do Jesus stuff. And I've not suffered for it. I think people who love Jesus more than the world quite simply open their homes to people. Romans 12, 13, they practice hospitality, but they open their homes to people who aren't like them. And you're prepared to part with mess and clutter and shoes everywhere and inconvenience because I think it's what the Lord calls us to because our lives are about people. And I, I think according to 1 Corinthians 6, 16, 2, that people who love Jesus more than the world, are generous people too. I think they're generous in every respect. I think they're generous with their giving and generous with their possessions. I think they don't claim stuff as their own, like Acts 2 and Acts 5. I think our lives are quite open if you love Jesus more than the world. And I don't think everyone should give equally, but I think we should all have equal sacrifice in our giving. I do, actually. And, and let's face it, if you're out of work and you're on... You're receiving benefits, you need it to get by and to just get that month through. Giving £10 a month can be much harder than someone on 50 grand a year is giving £50 a month, actually, without knowing what anyone's doing in the church particularly. You know, it's, and I'm not saying, I, don't, I think it's over-shepherding to say all you're giving to come into the church as a church leader because I think there's all kinds of good places to put money into God's kingdom. I think it's a bit of uh, exegetical gymnastics to talk about the storehouse just being a church. But, that's because I'm a parachute seed as well. But I do think we should all be giving and, and giving to the point of sacrifice for God's kingdom because we need millions of pounds in our country to reach millions of souls. We just genuinely do. I think we don't covet possessions. Obviously one of the Ten Commandments. But I don't think our eyes are on other people and what they've got. I think comparisons are not an issue for you if you love Jesus more than the world because you're securing your identity before Christ. One of the great releasing things in my own life was coming to a conclusion that there are always going to be much better speakers, much better leaders, much brighter people, much wiser people, certainly much slimmer people, certainly much taller people. You know, that is, that is just the world. That is, that is the way it is. 
but I know that God's placed his hand on me for what I can do. And with what little he's given me, I try and use it in a very focused and intentional way. And I'm not good at a lot, but I'm a mad, passionate evangelist, and I just pray that God uses that. And what he's given you, you use. Some of you are good at detail. Some of you are incredibly loving and compassionate. Some of you have gifts of intercession. Some of you have high capacity and some of you have low capacity. It's fine. Whatever God has given you, use it to the max. But don't worry about what other people have. Because it's, it's a sure way just to, just to burn up inside and get all bitter and twisted and chipped up and unhappy. Honestly, it really is. I spent the early years of my ministry in like mild depression lurking in the background that I was never going to be like this person or that person. and Bonkers, isn't it? And actually what it leads you to do is to try and extinguish someone else's light so that you look brighter, which is just stupid and horrible. So don't worry about what other people have got. I think people who love Jesus more than the world can distinguish between necessity and luxury. I really struggle with that one because I'm sure that some of my stuff I see as a necessity, but it's actually not. And I also think that people who love Jesus more than the world, the last thing I wrote on my list was that they don't view activities and life through a filter of what's best for them and what they like. They view life through a filter of what's best for everyone else. Do nothing, it says in Philippians, throughout selfish ambition or vain conceit, but be a servant of all. And do you know what makes a healthy church? Actually, it's really simple. Do you know what creates a sense of a healthy family? I know there's leadership and, you know, nice worship and average teaching and all that kind of stuff. But I actually think what makes a beautiful church full of beautiful, loving people is our eyes want on what works for everyone else, not on what works for you. And you, you try and walk emotionally, mentally a mile in someone else's shoes. And So like instead of getting round up if the kids are running around you, just come and spend a bit of time with them or volunteer in the kids' work or if you don't think that the tea's good enough for you, get on the rotor and do you know what I mean? Like if you're frustrated there's not evan enough evangelism happening, well just step up and help us and get involved and like if there's a curry night I don't, I've not had this said to me I'm just I'm thinking I'm shooting from the hip there's a curry night you don't go I don't like chicken boona which I personally don't you go I know a mate who loves chicken boona so I'm going to take him do you know what I mean so you, you, everything is through the filter of what will work and be a blessing for other people and I think I said this on a vision night because Karen had this felt this word from the Lord if we start really pushing into these things and we are faithful with the little things that God has given us and we're faithful in our characters with the little things 10 press ups if we're faithful with the little things that God has given us then you think I'm joking right you, God will bless us mightily in the big stuff like I really do if he sees our characters being fashioned and our priorities on the kingdom, seek first the kingdom, Jesus said. Seek first my kingdom. And all these things will be added to you. Love me before the world. And, and we're not all going to get there immediately. Because I have found for myself that the more I seek to press into the things of God, the more I realise I've just got a dark centre, actually. Like, and I've got all these issues that I've got to bring before the Lord and I, actually I'm quite selfish and I've said to you before I, my prayers are selfish, all about my kids and my wife and I've got to be praying for other stuff as well which a lot of my prayers are for the world and the poor and you know I try and be an evangelist but even that's on my own terms sometimes and so the more and more we press forward into the things of Jesus I think the more and more he'll show us stuff in our hearts and the more and more we become like Christ actually um, and I'm, as many of you know I'm still working through these things now and my health and the way I live my life because I just want to please the Lord 
actually. I, I want to please the Lord and I want to be faithful with the stuff that he's given me. And I, I don't want to be someone who when I kneel before Jesus, I'll put the world before him. And I know that I am in loads of ways. So as much as I've said this to you, I've said it to myself, but if I can in some small way be a rough rider for Jesus, if I can in some small way be gripped by that and be prepared to lay it all down, I think, we could actually change this nation. If every, if every Christian took up the call to bear the gospel front and centre, first and foremost, could actually change the nation. Did you know that? You really could. That's what it was always meant to do. The gospel was always meant to change the world. When he press up, so it's <laughs> right in front of <laughs> We used to actually do this at the CVM conferences. We used to say, like, if, it, you, you, if your phone goes off, you come at the front in front of two and a half thousand people and you do like 10 pull-ups or 10 press-ups. This bloke came forward and he said, I had a heart attack last week. I went, 50 press-ups in, <laughs> like that. He was like, that's terrible. I mean, it's a joke. Do five. No, we're fine. Anyway. So, bit of a challenging passage, bit tough, and I'm not, I'm not saying this is what you should do, because I don't believe that. I'm just putting out stuff that I think goes to the heart of the matter. Like, just to finish with this, we run Eden teams in the poorest communities. And I was talking in Ashford yesterday whether we should have Eden teams, because it's part of their town is in the top 10% areas of urban depriva deprivation. And... I was on a bit of a recruitment drive during one of my talks. I actually said to them, um, I think you don't need, you shouldn't pray, um, please show me if I should do this. You need to pray, please show me why I shouldn't do this. Actually, because that's, I think that's a more honest prayer. And I feel that for myself. You know, I'd spent years working in a poor community and I think, I need to have good reason why I can't do what I do. And I have asked that since I joined the message. I've asked that question of the Lord. And because I'm away from home so much, I'm traveling so much, and I've got so much going on, it'd actually be hugely unfair at the moment. So it's just not right. But I do continue to ask that question. If God ever called me away, we'd have to ask that question again. And so that's in my context. What is your prayer like that? What is your equivalent? I can't tell you what your prayer is. But I, what is your version of, I'll go wherever you tell me to go, I'll do whatever you ask me to do. Do you follow? So don't think I'm telling you what you should do. So you've got to find that from the Lord.